Welcome to Business Reporter's Best of Global Business campaign. I'm Rachel Hicks. If the headlines are anything to go by, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the relationship between states and citizens is broken. According to polls in Western countries, 80% of the citizens are dissatisfied how they're governed, no matter who's in charge. More and more people feel that besides casting one's vote every few years, they don't have a say in what's going on and what their tax money is spent for. Tax burden is growing, while at the same time the state's services are perceived as insufficient, be it security, education or infrastructure. Due to speech controlling laws, many people are afraid to speak out on controversial issues, the number of which is growing daily. As if that wasn't enough, the rules, and thereby the social contract, is changed constantly, albeit never from the side of the citizens. Unforeseeable changes in regulation make it difficult for business and individuals alike to plan for the long term. Do we need reform or fundamental change? Can we create a different relationship between individuals and groups with the state that's safer, freer, functions better, delivers the best services and brings prosperity? Imagine a city in which everybody has access to justice. Imagine a city where there's a family with two kids. They have the freedom and the power to influence what goes in the apartment building that they're living in. Imagine a city where anyone can choose the rules and the institutions that better suit their dreams, aspirations, and their lifestyle. It is entrepreneurially friendly. Where business is safe. It is technologically optimistic. I came across many successful examples of private planning on a smaller scale. The International Financial Center in Dubai. A theme park, Disneyland is a private city. Dubai's ranking in the Transparency International, the World Bank's ease of doing business rankings, were down at the bottom, and now they're up towards the top. Dr. Titus Gable, the president and CEO of Tipolis, is the inventor of the Free Private Cities, which is reinventing the social contract. Good morning, Titus. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Rachel. Now, You've tagged the new settlement a free private city, and we probably understand the concept of a city, but in this context, can you talk us through the free and the private bit? What is a free private city? Yeah, a free private city is basically based on a private company that is um, protecting your life, liberty, and property against a service fee. So it's a, it's a normal service provider who is acting as a state uh, service provider and um, that has the advantage that you have a real contract and your rights and obligations are in this contract. Now why it's called free? Because you are free to choose from um, the variety of decisions that are possible in your life. Many historical thinkers have envisaged their ideal society and, and usually a society, an ideal society is created in response to um, challenges for the economy, the state, the society. What in your view are the three failures um, that the design of your free private cities will address? First, a lack of consent. Second, is endless political struggle. And third, it's the wrong incentives for the decision makers. So if you are in a, in, a, in a normal state of today, then a lot of decisions are made that you cannot influence. So you have, for example, to uh, subsidize technologies that are not profitable, you would never invest in. You have to uh, um, finance military um, missions in foreign continents that you would not never support with your private money. You have to accept, for example, speech controlling and internet censoring laws. You may not agree with that. You will want freedom of speech, but you just have to accept that. You're not uh, okay with it. That's a lack of consent. The second point I made is about the endless political struggle. That is a function of the first one, because some interest groups have found out how to influence this decision making, and they are basically hijacking, they are lobbying, they're hijacking parliament, they're lobbying governments, and um, the more influence those groups uh, have, um, the more probable it is that they get their will, even if it's not the majority will. 
And that is always a problem because every political solution is only a solution that's partiality, that, that is a certain group has some ideas and is imposing their will upon all others. So a lot of people are dissatisfied uh, with their government. I mean, there have been polls in, uh, both in the US and the UK that shows that about 80% of the people are not satisfied with the way they are governed, regardless which party is in power. The third thing I mentioned is the wrong incentive structure. Politicians don't really have an incentive to act in the, in the interest of the society or the common good. The worst thing that can happen to them is they are, are voted out of power with the full pension. So the current system is giving them incentives to basically uh, make expenses uh, on behalf of society that um, is for their groups, for their bodies, that they are bribing voters by giving free lunch and other benefits uh, because then they get elected. It's not their money, so they can do that easily. So what guarantees the rights and the duties of citizens living here? Well, there are two elements. First is the, the formal one, and the other one is then the, the, the practical one. The formal one is the contract. The contract is guaranteeing your rights because they're written down in the contract. And if you think your contract has been broken, you can go to the city courts and get a title or an award. The other one is the practical one. Of course, I could as an operator say, okay, there's an award against me. I don't care. But this would mean I would go out of business eventually. This commercial interest is really what's keeping me in line and the competition with other places that is really incentivizing me to, to deliver the best product. Okay, Titus, let's imagine that you have the land ready to build the city. Perhaps you could give me a tour and tell me, first of all, where would you situate? It would be situated on the sea to enable trade. There's a port here in the center, and then there will be a main road going to the Agora, where people can assemble, people can meet and, um, and discuss. There will be um, a town hall and an experimental area down there where people can try out new things without zoning and building regulation and we can see how this is developing. And so talk to me a little bit more about the centre. Of the first settlement is about 1,000 residents, that is our target size. If we look at the second phase, how does the city develop and, and where are the different areas like the industrial area and yeah. things like that? So, so the, the next phase would be up to 10,000 people and the idea is to have as many mixed zones as possible so that people can work where they live. But there will be some industries that are noisy or creating other kinds of emissions so you have to separate them. There will be here um, an industrial area and we will build a commercial bigger port and uh, there will be maybe also power generation power plant here. Um, if needed, and the initial port will become a marina. And how large do you envisage these cities getting in total? Yeah. The idea is that you can reach everything within walking distance, then the, the size shouldn't be more than 1.5 square kilometers, and that is a natural, I would say, uh, limit, about 30,000 people. And after that, instead of building remote suburbs somewhere out there, you would just take this structure and replicate it um, so that people can still feel uh, that everything is reachable and within walking distance. So, Dr. Titus Gable, let's look to the future. Tell me, how does this develop? What's your vision for the next 10 years? We will attract um, people who are really interested in the uh, uh, regulatory framework which is giving them a lot of freedoms that might be individuals, might also be companies who are suffering from, from high regulations. And then we want to show the world because the participation is 100% voluntary. I would say eventually people go where they are treated best. We are already in neg negotiations with some governments. Uh, within five to ten years we can really show something. Even if only a few free private cities will come into existence in the next years or decades, then they will be a blueprint for all societies and people might start saying, hey, these, these free private cities uh, residents, they have a contract with the operator. I also want to be treated as a customer from your government. Give me also a contract. That might happen. And I think these free private cities will flourish and uh, be an example what people and their creativity can, can achieve. 
We'll watch closely. Thank you very much for coming in and talking to us today. My pleasure.